your seats if you don't already, and again, welcome. Welcome to New Hope this morning. We're going to be continuing this morning in our sermon series called Living a Countercultural Life. And I'm excited to uh, dig into our scripture passage this morning. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can uh, flip over to uh, Matthew 5, uh, starting with chapter, or, uh, chapter 5, but starting with verse 17. We'll be looking at verses 17 through 20 this morning. If you have a regular Bible, yes, they still do exist. They're in front of you in your chairs. Uh, they might look like this. They might be red or black, and you can also open them. They do have God's Word in them today. Um, so that's from uh, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. We'll get there in just a few minutes. I don't know if any of you have uh, listened. I, I might have been listening to ESPN radio this week. Uh, I might have been trying to get my head wrapped into a certain game that's happening later on today. Um, I don't know if any of you would do that or not, but uh, ESPN has this fantastic way of marketing um, certain products, and they really do know who they're talking to. They know their audience quite well. And uh, of course, what comes on the radio, but nothing more than, uh, men, listen up. You can lose 40 pounds in three weeks. Just sign up for this new pill and you can have the ultimate in weight loss experience, right? Well, of course they know who they're talking to, and I'm, my ears are perked up, aren't they? Because it's the new year, and I'm thinking spring is coming, and what a great way to kick off spring would be to lose 40 pounds. That would be fantastic. All right, no comments, but we can talk later, all right? But the idea is that every time I've heard one of those advertisements, every time you hear about a new fad diet or a new program or anything like that, and I've done my fair share of them, all right, admittedly, uh, what does it always boil down to? Somebody tell me, what is it always, boil? there's two words, well, I, I'm not hurt, say it louder, self those aren't the two words, but it does, it boils down to self dis diet and exercise, right? How about those two words, diet and exercise, you, if you want to lose weight, eat well and exercise properly, all right, it doesn't take a lot of pills and fad diets and all those things, just diet, eat right, get a lot of sleep, right, that's important, and then exercise, and you will lose weight, okay? Why do I start with that particular story? I think to a certain extent that is where we find ourselves in the sermon, in, uh, in the way Jesus is kind of making a transition with these verses today. So in uh, verse 17, he makes a transition, and let's just walk through this really quickly. This is where we are today. But to review, this is how we got to where we are. So Jesus has modeled love and access for everyone. That's the Beatitudes. He has opened up his heart. He has healed. He has uh, brought renewal to all kinds of people, whether they were Jew or Gentile, whether they understood who he was or not. They knew he could do something powerful and profound. So Jesus has modeled this love and access for everyone. And then he goes on and he says, I want you to model it too. I want you to share it. I want you to be the salt. I want you to be the light. And that's what we talked about last week. And, and then this is all kind of confirmation that my kingdom is here and it's available now. It's not something that we're just waiting to get to. It is here and it is now. So that's kind of just a synopsis of where we've been for the last four weeks, working our way through the first part of Matthew chapter 5, what we call uh, the Sermon on the Mount, one of Jesus' uh, most well-known sermons, uh, one of several in, in the book of Matthew, but one of his most well-known sermons to even non-Christians when they hear the Sermon on the Mount. So that's just a review, but again, just kind of reminding ourselves that, that something new, right, always makes us think that we can do away with the old. All right, if I can take a pill to lose weight, well, then maybe I don't have to diet and exercise, right? But that is not the case, right? So Jesus, in his sermon on the mount, has, is moving through now what I would call some transitional verses. And anybody that's ever preached or anybody that's ever given a speech or talked or anything like that, you know that transitions in uh, a sermon are essential. Transitions in a speech are essential because they link kind of main points. The interesting thing about Jesus' transition here is that it becomes almost a main point in and of itself, but it really is a link to where he's been, right? This is who I've come for, and I want you to model it. This is what I want you to do with it, but now we're kind of transitioning into 
but you know what? We're not gonna, we're not gonna just get rid of everything that you've always known. That's the transition here, okay? So we're moving into some verses, and the very first verse, well, he gives us this challenge, right? This challenge with this transition is to move above and beyond the form of religion or religious experience to a loving application of our faith that flows from an inner transformation of our heart. So this transition, these verses, kind of summarized into this phrase that I've developed here, but from form to loving function. That's kind of what we want to think about today. From form to loving function. And, and the idea is that we're not necessarily going to learn how to do that, but in these verses today, we are being given the challenge. Is this how you want to live? Or I challenge you to live this way, from form to loving function. So that's kind of our focus for today. And the first point I want to point out, if you're in verse uh, 17 now, um, it says, and this is kind of the idea, we want to first of all be careful with our assumptions. In verse 17, Jesus says, do not think, do not think. That's a transitional thought, right? We have just become this idea of being salt and, and become light and all of this kind of stuff. And, and there's this enthusiasm, there's this excitement. This is a new teaching. This is something exciting that goes outside of the norm of what we've known from the temple and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. But, but Jesus now brings them back to earth. This is kind of like, but you still got to diet and you still got to exercise. All right? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So the idea is we have to be careful with our own motives. When we start hearing new things in Scripture, and we start hearing new teaching, and we start hearing new interpretations of Scripture, it doesn't mean that we throw out the old and in with the new, right? And, and there's a lot of fad ways of, of following Christ today where we can kind of throw out the old stuff and just kind of let's just do it this way now because it's the newest and the, the fanciest and it's the most fun. But no, Jesus is kind of like, no, do not think that I've come to abolish those old ways. No, I've just simply come to fulfill them. And we read about in Proverbs 16, verse 2, it says, all a person's ways, all of a person's ways seem pure to them, but it is God who judges our motives. God is the only one that judges our motives. Motives are weighed by the Lord. And we need to constantly be assessing because when we're hearing Scripture, when we're hearing God's teaching, when we're hearing the way we filter it, we have our own understanding, right? We bring our own bias to it. We bring our own cultural perspectives. We bring our own denominational experiences. We bring a lot to the table. And so we have to unpack our own motives. How are we hearing this? So when Jesus says, do not think, he's like, all right, let's just take everything that you know, set that down for a second, this is what we need to be focused on, all right? This happened in the Bible in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's happened a lot where motives kind of come into play. This particular story in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, this is a story of David and Goliath. Some of you will be familiar with it, but David was sent to the front line. David was sent to the front line to bring some food and resources and, and help his brothers and the Lord's army, right, to, to just kind of go help him and take care of his brothers on the front line. And when he gets there, he sees Goliath, who's taunting the army, and he speaks up, like, why are you letting him get away with this? And, and what do his brothers do? His brothers are like, who, who, why are you here? You're, you're only here for selfish gain. You're only here to make us look bad. You're only here for... And they start putting David down for why he's come to support them. So, interesting, right? David is there because his father told him to. His brothers are assessing the motives of his heart. And they're wrong, of course, because David's heart was not for selfish gain or not to make his brothers look bad or anything. David's heart was, was pure in that moment, and they couldn't see it. Their own eyes were a little bit blinded. Of course, in the New Testament, we have... Jesus being assessed on his motives all the time, eating with tax collectors and sinners, and, you know, everybody's judging, why are you here, and what are you doing, and why are you hanging out with them, and what's your point, and all this kind of stuff going on. This idea of assessing our motives 
is all throughout the scriptures. And we're going to study that again in a couple of weeks when we look uh, over into Matthew chapter 7, but we'll come back to that. Right now, this idea of assessing our motives and being careful with our assumptions is kind of rooted in this idea of grace meeting truth. The beginning part of Matthew, the door has been flung wide open, and, my, and God's embrace is for everyone, and we need to model that, that now there's this grace, now, it, now it's going to meet truth, where all this love and this embrace gets embodied also in the fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of what's going on all throughout Israel's history, and of course, that leaves us with kind of an assessment, you know, what, what's going on inside of our own hearts and what's going on inside of our own minds. So we must seek clarity. That's kind of our second point. When we look into verse 18, he says, For I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear until everything is accomplished or fulfilled. He's to seek clarity. He's, he's, he's moved us from, well, don't think that we're getting rid of this to we're definitely not getting rid of this. What is he saying? He's reinforcing both God's will throughout time all the way back into the Old Testament, the institution of the Mosaic Law. We've studied those. Some of you were here when we studied the Ten Commandments, right? And uh, the great Shema, some of you will know that, the, the Lord our God, the Lord, he is one, right? And, and there are so many laws and, and the Mosaic Covenant, 613 of them. And, and then there were things that were kind of added on and changed over time. But you can read them from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Old Testament. And Jesus is saying, you know what? None of that's going away. All that I've just told you, yes, I'm here to fulfill that. I'm here to make that look the way God intended it to look. And I want you to follow in my footsteps. Clarity, when we seek it, when we're really looking for it, leads to belief, which I think leads to application, and then prayerfully leads to impact. So we have to be looking, we have to be seeking, testing our motives, and then seeking the clarity of what it is that we are searching out and looking for. In this particular case, Jesus affirmed the law. He affirmed God's plan, and he affirmed history. He put it all in its proper context, of course, but he affirmed it, and he affirmed it all. Moses, back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses uh, 7 through 9, says this, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and to your grandsons and granddaughters. And Moses goes on and on to affirm God had spoken to them. God had given them something special. And of course, we know today, looking back throughout time, that it was impossible for them to keep the law in their own strength. They needed somebody else, Jesus, and then ultimately the Holy Spirit to come in and provide the aid that was necessary to fulfill God's purpose and plan. In this process, he is building this transition. It's a transition, or a bridge you might call it, between what he's promoting, what he's living, and what his divine and religious role was as a priest. Jesus was walking into the fulfillment of all of this. And he's using these verses to help his would-be apprentices to comprehend the transition in focus, to bring it back to some of the things that were grounded, that were sure, that were true. And it reminded me kind of a little bit of 
the world that we live in. Because again, when we, we are predisposed, when we hear something new to let go of the old, and when we hear of something like God's loving and grace and God's grace, and, and it's, we do want to throw our arms wide open, but, but there's, there's some boundaries to that, right? There's some limits to that. There's some things that we have to go back to in Scripture that help to hold us accountable, and we are also to share those things as well. And it becomes this opportunity to develop relationship. Not to pound truth at the expense of grace and not to lovingly embrace at the expense of truth, but to bring those two things together in loving relationship. And that's really what these verses are promoting and helping us think through. What Jesus kind of moves us to is this idea that you have to decide. You're, it's on you. you. You move toward a decision when you really embrace one or the other or you embrace what he's talking about here. So we have to clarify our assumptions, right? And we have to seek some clarity. Once we have sought that clarity, then it's, upon us now to decide what our path is. He goes on in verse 19 to say, Therefore, if anyone sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It's a choice. Why was he making that choice? It's one of the rich aspects of these few verses that we don't have time to unpack today, but, but I would challenge you, there's a ton of innuendo in that verse. And I just challenge you to go and dig a little bit. Who is he talking about, right? And you'll find out in verse 20, there's a more specific reference, but there's a lot of innuendo built into verses 17 through 20. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating. But the bottom line is he gives us a choice. You can ignore or you can embrace God's plan. And what you choose to do has consequences one way or the other. It's those consequences that he's referring to and that he's trying to set up his hearers for the remainder of this particular sermon that he is speaking to the people with. Kind of thinking about kind of an application, you know, that decision point, right? I was thinking about uh, I was thinking about when you're hanging out with your friends. All right, you're hanging out with your friends and you've got uh, music comes on and you're in a group of people. You might be in school, you might be on the bus, you might be anywhere, right? But that music comes on and you have a moment. You have a moment like, that doesn't sound like something I should be listening to. And you kind of have that decision point. What do I do? Do I just fit in? Do I just hang out? Do I just kind of keep hanging out? Or do I walk away and declare this is who I am and that's not for me? That's not right. Uh, some of you are filling out your taxes. And some of you are going to be filling out your income. And some of you are going to be wrestling with that income that might not necessarily have been reported to the government already. And should I report that income to the government? And you have a decision point to make, right? It's, it's a decision. What are you going to do with it, right? Sometimes we get angry. Sometimes we're feeling like in that moment some words pop into my head and I have a decision. Do they come out of my mouth? Or do I exhibit self-control for the case of the people that are around me or for my own sake? All of those things, it's not so much to spend time thinking about those things, but just to illustrate the point that we are faced with decisions daily. We are faced with decisions all the time. Some of them are big, some of them have big consequences, some of them are small, and nobody will ever know. 
Side note, that's where integrity comes in, right? If we make decisions when nobody's looking, that no consequence will come to us by virtue of what people see. But I know, right? Where's my integrity? Do I make the same decision in that moment as in any other moment? But that's really what Jesus is talking about there in verse 19. You have a choice to embrace my truth. You have a choice to walk away from my truth. And then he moves us into verse 20. And I call this the hinge verse. It's really, I think, the the pivotal transition point in the sermon that moves us into a whole other aspect of his sermon that we'll start to get into and unpack next week. But the verse is, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's a lot that we could unpack with uh, this particular verse. A lot. Uh, We were talking about it in preparation for this morning, and I was saying how there are about four different different Bible studies that I came up with just on these four verses alone, and I had to try not to teach them all to you this morning. So you can thank Sarah and Katrina for reminding me that I couldn't do that this morning, but... This is one of those verses that actually within it has maybe two, at least, if not more Bible studies associated with it. One verse. It's just, it's rich. And and we're not going to get into it, but the point here and the point we want to really focus on is our minds when we see, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, like some of your minds are going to go to performance. I have to be better than the Pharisees. All right, so how do I get better than the Pharisees? How do I do what they aren't doing? What's the bar? And, and, you, and you can do a study. That's actually one of the studies. You could spend some time. Who were the Pharisees? What did they think? What were they believing? Why was Jesus calling the Pharisees out? It's a fascinating study to really dig down and, and think also that in this group of people, this collection of people that he's talking to up on this hillside, there are probably some Pharisees, teachers of the law, that were amongst them, It is quite possible, so not only is he calling them out, he's also using them as a bad example to say, you got to be better than them, and our minds are going to say, well, how? Tell me how, and we've got to really resist that. I use this analogy, it's kind of like, uh, for you football fans, because it's happening today, right? Uh, If you only focus on performance, it's kind of like catching the ball, turning up field, but dropping it. They wouldn't count that as completion, all right? They would say that that was a dropped pass. You had your eyes on the ball, you turned up field, and you dropped the ball. That's an incomplete pass. Some of you will remember there's also the analogy of uh, kicking a field goal, and it just goes a little bit to the right, and it didn't quite make it. Buffalo Bill fans, thank you, all right? The idea is, right... Just, I had to get some football in here today. Sorry, I just had to help you out, right? I know your minds, where your minds are. But, but the idea is we're just missing the mark when we think about performance because performance is what the Pharisees were all about. That's the whole point. The Pharisees had taken the law. They had mangled it to the point that it was really not recognizable. They had twisted it so much. They made the law into something that really they couldn't break. That's what they did. They added on all these laws and these rules and these statutes and all these kinds of things, and they made it for themselves something that was almost impossible to break, which is a fascinating idea. But it was all about form. It was all about a religious exercise. They thought in keeping the law, they were doing what God commanded. In fact, if you go all the way back, and I'm giving you just a little bit of what you could do in your own Bible study. If you go all the way back, the Pharisees actually came together believing that the reason they went into the Babylonian captivity, some of you will remember the Israelites got taken by Babylon uh, well before Christ was born, but many, many years, they, they got taken by Babylon. The Pharisees believed that it was all because they didn't believe the law well enough. They didn't hold to the law. So you can imagine... Their whole focus as Pharisees was to, let's get back to the basics. Let's get back to the law. But in so doing, they had to do it in such a way to insulate themselves so that they could keep everything. And if you want to do a little bit more study, go over to Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9, and you can read a little bit in Matthew 15 where Jesus calls them out for just one of them. 
for about honoring their father and their mother and, and how they had kind of set that law, they had transformed and mangled that law. It was supposed to be about honoring your father and your mother, but, but you could say, you know what, I can't support you, I can't help you out. And by saying I can't help you out, somehow you were justified, but are you really justified? No, you're supposed to honor your father and your mother, you're supposed to take care of them. And Jesus called them out for that. That's just one small example of the way the Pharisees weren't living up to this. So this verse, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, he's not talking about performance. He's talking about the inner condition of our hearts. He's talking about, let's go back to that first point, talking about our motives, about our assumptions. Let's dig deeper. Let's get under the radar. I have come to fulfill this law, not go through the religious exercises, but I have come to fulfill this law. Now, the next study you could do, and we're going to do it just briefly here this morning, is look at this word righteousness. It's a fascinating word, and uh, for my study, I was using uh, the help of Dallas Willard and some of his uh, explanation of this, but the, the word righteousness, the Greek translation of this in this particular passage is dikeiosune. That's, I think, how you pronounce it, but the idea is the inner life as it should be, or you might say true inner goodness. Now, we've encountered this word a couple of times already in this Sermon on the Mount. We encountered it back in verse 6 and back in verse 10 as well. It's been used twice already, and if you read certain translations, you would see it translated as the word justice. And the problem with translating the word as justice is that it only gets sort of part of the context. Justice is clearly a part of it, like God is a God of justice, and we want to be about changing injustices and addressing injustices, but but the idea of righteousness is so much deeper, it's so much more rich than just the idea of justice. It's this idea of what our inner life is to be like. We want what's inside of us to come so naturally, to flow out so naturally, that following the laws of God and following the ways of God is just something we do without thinking about it. But I suspect many of us find it hard to follow the ways of God. It doesn't flow very naturally, and that's what Jesus is talking about in this particular phrase. This, this word, dikeosune, goes all the way back to Plato. He wrote a book called The Republic, and uh, if you do a little etymology or study of the word, uh, in that book he used this word to describe the condition in which the soul must be in in order for human beings to live well and manage to do what is right. So even all the way back to Greek philosophy and Greek thought, they were thinking, in fact, that's just a natural part of human condition. We always want to know how to live, right? We always want, we always want to know how to live right, right? That's the idea in this particular case is Jesus was using a word that in their Hellenistic culture, which is what they were kind of being influenced by, in addition to being ruled by Rome, they had been influenced by the Greek thinking. He's taking this word and he's putting it in their context, but he's marrying it with a Hebrew understanding because back in the third century, back in the third century, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament had been translated into the Greek. We call it the Septuagint, okay? So back in the third century, it had been this word, dikeosune, was used to translate the word in Hebrew, sedakwa, or sedak, whatever one of those variations this word had been used. So let me just put it for you in, in stark uh, terms here. Genesis 15, 6. Some of you will remember that. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as? Dikeosune is the word that was chosen there. All right? Isaiah 64, 6. All our righteousness is like filthy rags. All our dikeosune is like filthy rags. All of our inner goodness. You might understand that to be. Or Amos 5.24. These are familiar, but you might not recognize them. But let judgment roll down as water and as an impossible flood. Dikeosune is the way that word was translated. So you could bring that forward into the New Testament where Dallas Willard kind of points out that for Paul, 
in writing the, the letter to the Romans, says the key redemptive act of Jesus becomes the key to understanding the very dikeiosune of God himself, the righteousness of God himself. That's Romans 1 through 8. It is the person of Jesus and his death for us that makes clear what it is about God that makes him really good. So to understand this term, unless your righteousness, we have to understand what is it that God wants to make us into. We want to be really good. We want to know how to live rightly. And Jesus is challenging us to live rightly. This is the idea that is embodied in this particular term. So, this, so we kind of are moving from this idea of acts or religious experiences, religious exercises into something that involves our heart, a heart transformation, a heart transition. For many years, I worked in a setting where we dealt with the issue uh, of addiction in people's lives. Men, women would come and be looking for some sort of transformative experience because they were uh, addicted to either drugs or alcohol, and, and in most cases that's what we were dealing with, but there were often residual impacts in their lives and things that they were addicted to, and we learned very quickly that you can give tips and tools for how to manage your life, and people can manage their life, manage their addiction for a period of time, but it's very difficult for that to last over a lifetime unless you get to the source. And you've heard it referenced, right? You can teach a man to fish and he'll fish for a day. You can, I'm sorry, you can give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, but you can teach someone to fish and they'll eat for a lifetime. That's the idea that is pregnant with what Jesus is talking about in this verse. It's time to move beyond the form and move into a loving application of all of this this law, this way that you've been living, this idea. This is hard to read, but I had to give it to you. Uh, so I'm going to read it with you. But it's just, it just kind of sums up a, little, a lot of what moves me about these particular verses. And I just wanted to share it with you. It comes from the Divine Conspiracy. It says this, Unclean hearts, hearts not renewed and made whole by the work of Jesus Christ, ultimately triumph over our intentions. I could have just stopped right there. That, that, that catches me. The condition of your heart will triumph over your intentions every day. If you want to just clean up the outside without cleaning up the inside, you can expect to get back to what you know is wrong, ultimately. Eventually, we will simply do what we know to be wrong. Our words will reveal the contents of our hearts. Matthew 12, 34, out of the heart the mouth speaks. But our need to appear righteous before men will force us into hypocrisy. Hypocrisy becomes the spirit or yeast that taints our entire existence. This is the yeast that infects so many human relationships all around us, even within the church the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the yeast of having a form of religious experience without having a loving application of it. It's powerful. It's, it's just, you have to spend time with it, wrestle with it. You can't perform your way into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can allow him into your life. You can allow him to transform your heart. And it's in that inner transformation that you begin to live the righteousness that's called for in the New Testament. That salvation experience that comes through righteousness, through loving God, that's what Jesus is calling us to. It's the combination of the grace and the truth, it's the mere marrying of those two things together. So, from today, let's just review really quickly. 
we need to be careful with our assumptions. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. It all sounds really good, but we need to stay grounded in what we know to be true. And then we need to seek that clarity, like, help me to understand, God. Help me to dig in and, and know what's going on here. And then when I'm faced with that choice, I can choose one way or the other. That's God's gift to you. You have a choice. You can follow and obey and teach others to obey, or you can set them aside and teach others to do that as well. But that's your choice. The ultimate goal is this inward change of our hearts, looking at how we live, how we operate. Dallas Willard would say, an apple tree bears apples without any problem because it's the nature of the tree to produce apples. We want to be able to effortlessly live God's life that he's calling us to live because it's the nature of our heart to do so. And that's really where the Sermon on the Mount is now heading over the next weeks and there's a lot more that we're going to get into and unpack together. So next steps for us today really look like this. Number one, I'd encourage you to memorize Matthew 5.20. I think it is a critical verse, and sometimes we've misread it or misunderstood it, but hopefully today you've had a little bit of light shed into it, and uh, I'd love to have that verse be memorized by all of us. Second one is do a Bible study on that word righteousness, daikeiosune. Spend some time with that. Where does it show up? And look at the different contexts for it and try to understand the richness of it. You will see it in its different forms, righteousness and justice and peace. And there's a lot of different forms that it will take, but it's getting at this idea of true inner goodness. And then thirdly, ask God to forgive impurities in your heart. For that, you have to actually open up your heart, let your heart be seen by God, and then we spend some time reflecting on that and seeking his forgiveness. But where is your heart not in alignment with the things that you think he's calling you to do or with things you know he's calling you to do because that's what scripture says to do? That's the choice that you have this morning. That's the choice that we all have every day, right? To let God penetrate into our hearts. We're going to spend a couple of minutes now and simply respond through reflection. Uh, there'll be some music just playing quietly. And as that music is playing, I just encourage you to reflect. Maybe you pray. The altars are open. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to come back and we're going to partake in communion together. And it's our opportunity to uh, receive from God sort of that renewed connection to him, to participate in obedience through the sacrifice that he made to partake of his body and his blood, his forgiveness. And but maybe we need some time to give our hearts a chance to receive that forgiveness as we prepare for that. So let's just take a few minutes. If you'd like to write down on a prayer card in front of you or uh, anything like that, you'll be able to share those with us through the offering basket here or at the end of our service, there'll be a chance for collecting those as well. Um, but let us know what's going on in your heart and we'd love to hear it. We do pray for you each and every day uh, or each and every week at least, I can promise you that. Um, but we are praying, we are a praying church, we believe in the power of prayer. Reflect, what is the Lord saying to you right now? <laughs> 